an additional all-day seminar workshop on Tuesday, as listed in your program. And the room for that will be one of these rooms in this room here that's divided, uh, one of the divided rooms uh, that will be divided off. We'll let you know about that, too, as time, uh, in the time that, just before, uh, or by Monday. The subjects that he will cover are listed, so I will not mention those. Every year we want to have at least two speakers on the subject of freedom, how to maintain it, how to retain it, or how to regain it. If we don't do that, we won't have meetings like this, maybe as early as next year. We've got four or five hundred people here who come from 35 to 40 some states who can go home and carry various messages as to what can be done. You are very a very select group to learn some of the things that you'll be learning here and that you can spread this message all over this country and uh, even further. The situation is really grave, I believe, that's my opinion, you can have your opinion after this is over or have it already. But I do think we need to be alert to the things that we can do by ourselves. And the next gentleman coming now, he now resides in Missouri. George conducts what's known as the, or the Barristers, or he is the founder of the Barristers School of Barristers in Boise. Idaho, and now he conducts the George Gordon School of Common Law, pertaining to the rights of individuals. People have attended his courses from all over the nation, and he is here because some of the doctors who attend this con uh, conference have been on my, uh, for uh, over a year, you ought to get George Gordon, you ought to get George Gordon, you ought to get George Gordon to talk to you. So we're happy that he's able to be here today and worked it into his schedule, he's going to speak on uh, the subject, no longer licensed. Welcome, George Gordon. Thank you, Thank you Dean. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I teach the <coughs> civil and common law as it relates to individuals, and the type of law that I teach is something different than probably most of you have seen on television through Perry Mason, or maybe in the movies, or perhaps you've had that experience of hiring attorney. And like I did in 1978, I engaged a legal firm between 1978 and 82. For six years, we did six cases, and in those six cases, or the six years, we lost six. I paid $6,000 a year to lose six cases. It finally dawned on me that perhaps if I fired my attorney and did it myself, it would cost me nothing to lose. And surprisingly, <laughs> the next 16 I won. Now I teach pro se litigation, and I have argued some 59 cases, now I've won 51, lost eight and have five in litigation. And my purpose here is to show you that there is an opposite to the standard legal process. For instance, I travel without insurance. I'm sure most of you have insurance on your automobiles and your homes. And you may say, well, that's a preposterous concept to live your life without insurance. But let me put it to you this way. Has anybody ever explained to you that there was an alternative to insurance? That there was a thing called a bond that you could have used, which comes from the old common law term, bond servant, a servant who is bonded or pledged for his debt. The same thing is true with licensing. I'm sure that all of us in here have licenses, or we have had at one time or another. I remember the first license that I obtained, I was 16 years old. I wanted a driver's license because I wanted fast wheels. And I went down to the Department of Motor Vehicles in California and I <clears throat> went through the normal indoctrination. And I asked the lady behind the counter, what is the purpose of this license? Now I'm only 16 years old, but I asked the question, what's the purpose? And she said, 
It's to show that you're competent and you have to take a test in order to get a driver's license. So I took the test, like all the rest of you have. And when I got through taking the test and had passed it, I still didn't understand why I needed the license. Because I was either competent or I wasn't. And after I'd passed the test, I was competent, wasn't I? So therefore, I didn't need the license. But I took it anyway, and I put it in my back pocket like everyone does. And I didn't think too much about this until the next licensing came up, and it was my pilot's license. I was about 19 when I took the test, and I asked that question also. I went to Oakland, California to take that one. And I asked the man that was giving the test, what's the purpose of this? And he said, it's for competence. Well, obviously, I was already competent because I'd already soloed. Since I'd soloed, then I obviously knew how to fly. So if I knew how to fly, then why did I need a piece of paper in my pocket to show you that I knew how to fly? What difference did it make to you whether I knew how? I was the guy who was going to live or die if I didn't. But that one was a little different. You see, I didn't get a license from the FAA. I got a certificate of competence. And as long as I kept my medical current and my logbook up to date, I could fly. Now that one is a little different from the driver's license. The third one was the marriage license. <laughs> now that one. <clears throat> I did totally blind. I had no experience whatsoever. <laughs> and I asked that lady behind the counter, what's the purpose for this license? And she said, I thought competence would come into play. <laughs> and I was going to have to show that I was competent. But no, I didn't. She said, this one is for disease. We want this license so that <clears throat> We can test you for disease and find out whether you're diseased or not. I passed that test also, which then left me with the question, well, now that I don't have disease, why do I need the license? <coughs> so <clears throat> we put that one in the top drawer, and I went on to the next one, which was my contractor's license. Now, I had to take a pretty rigorous test for my contractor's license. And I asked the gentleman, what's the purpose for this? And he said, to demonstrate your competence again. But <clears throat> I never went out and built anything for anybody. What I did was I read a book. I memorized the facts. And then I went in to take the test. You know, <clears throat> you could be a school teacher from Monrovia, California. Read the book, memorize the facts, go in and take the test, and you too could qualify to be a general contractor. I knew there was something wrong with this process of memorization and recitation, because I'd never built a house in my life, and I didn't know how to build a set of stairs, which is the first thing I always ask a carpenter when I hire him today. Can you build a set of stairs? If he says, yes, I can, he's probably a carpenter. If he says, no, I can't, he's probably a general contractor. <laughs> Now that's called a professional license, and the next one was my corporate license. Now they don't call this one a, uh, a license, they call this a corporate charter. So I went to my attorney and I organized a company. And my attorney, when I asked him the question, I said, well, what type of a company should we form? Should it be a proprietorship or a limited general partnership or corporation? He never hesitated, he said, a corporation. I said, oh, okay. Well, after all, he'd been to law school, and I looked up on the wall, and I saw all of the certifications that he had. He must have had 10 or 15 pieces of paper on the wall. And I was very impressed. Anybody with that many pieces of paper must know something. That's the same fellow now, remember, that defended us in six lawsuits, and we lost six out of six. <laughs> Whatever he was competent at, it wasn't defending lawsuits. So we incorporated, and when we did, we found that there were there were repercussions that came in. There was OSHA and the EPA, and there was the State Tax Commission. One day I woke up and I said to my secretary, would you please tell me how many government agencies do we deal with? 
And she said, well, I don't know. So she went to the file cabinet, and a couple hours later, she came back, and she said, 28, I think. 28 agencies of government. You know, you have to have a <coughs> city business license and a county business license, and then you have to deal with the <coughs> Department of Transportation and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Then there's the Department of Labor and the <coughs> Social Security people and the income tax people and the state sales tax people and OSHA and the EPA, and the list just goes on and on and on of all these government agencies that you deal with. And all of us in this room deal with all of those agencies. Maybe not all together, but you deal with two or three or five or nine right now. And those people control you. There's a building inspector who comes over and tells you how to build your building. And there is a medical examiner who tells you that you're practicing medicine without a license or you're incompetent to do whatever it is that you think you are competent to do. But what causes this? Where do these licenses come from? What is the legal relationship. Why is it that the state of Colorado hires people to come out and investigate your activities and then tell you how to conduct your life? What's the purpose behind it? The story begins about 1905 in a case called Hale versus Hinkle in which the Supreme Court made this observation concerning corporations and individuals. It's a short plain statement. Conceding that the witness was an officer of the corporation under investigation and that he was entitled to assert the rights of the corporation with respect to the production of its books and papers, we're of the opinion that there is a clear distinction in this particular between an individual and a corporation. Now, I want you to notice that there is a clear distinction in a corporation, that Safeway, and an individual. Whatever this mysterious creature called an individual is, there's a clear distinction. And that the latter, that is the corporation, has no right to refuse to submit its books and papers for an examination at the suit of the state. Now a lot of us have been examined by the state, whether or not it was done by suit or whether it was just an OSHA inspector who walked in or an EPA man or a state tax commission, sales tax man. Somebody walks into your store and he says, I want to look at your records and books. Could it be that you thought you were an individual, but in reality you were acting or were a corporation? Because you do not need to sign a corporate charter to become a corporation. All you need to do is act in a corporate capacity in commerce under the Commerce Clause, and you're treated for the purposes of law, taxation, as a corporation. And you have no right to refuse to submit your books and papers to the examination of the state. Now there's another fellow here called an individual. And the court goes on to say the individual may stand upon his constitutional rights as a citizen. He is entitled to carry on his private business in his own way. Please note the word private business. Because Many times we think that we're operating in private business. After all, isn't that what we call small, private business? Public business, isn't that public? Isn't that the telephone company and PG&E? That's public business. <clears throat> but Sally's Graphic Arts, isn't that private business? No, it isn't. In fact, Sally has a social security number or perhaps even a federal or a state identification number, a tax ID number, which makes her a corporate capacity. And she has all the rights, privileges, and immunities of the telephone company and PG&E without the financial resources to go along with it. His power, that is the individual's power to contract, is unlimited. An individual has an unlimited power to contract. How many of you have an unlimited power to contract? Or does government limit your power to contract by interfering with your business operation through inspections? He owes no duty to the state or to his neighbors to divulge his business or to open his doors to an investigation so far as it may tend to incriminate him. And he owes no such duty to the state since he receives nothing therefrom. Now there's a clue. Whoever this individual is, he receives nothing from the state. 
Evidently, he's not entitled to welfare, food stamps, aid to families with dependent children, or free school lunches. His rights are such as existed by the law of the land long antecedent to the organization of the state and can only be taken from him by due process of law and in accordance with the Constitution. But wait a minute. How many of you have ever picked up a newspaper and read about somebody's children being taken from them and put in a foster home because they were educating them at home or they were doing something that displeased the state? Happens every day, doesn't it? Two million times a year, to be exact. Among his rights are a refusal to incriminate himself and the immunity of himself and his property from arrest or seizure except under a warrant of the law. This individual has a lot of power here. He's immune from process. He has constitutional rights. <clears throat> no one can come in and search his records and books. But wait a minute. How many times have we picked up a newspaper and we saw that there was an IRS raid or that somebody's business has been closed? Somebody had some power to close that business, didn't they? Where did that power come from? He owes nothing to the public so long as he does not trespass upon their rights. Now, on the other hand, here comes the corporation. The corporation is a creature of the state. It is presumed to be incorporated for the benefit of the public, from each according to his ability and to each according to his need. It receives certain special privileges and franchises and holds them subject to the laws of the state and the limitations of its charter. Its powers are limited by law. It can make no contract not authorized by its charter, and its rights to act as a corporation are only preserved to it so long as it obeys the law of its creator. Now that's a corporation. An individual is something different than that. Let's take a look at what's called now the guardian-ward relationship and see whether or not this may have happened to you. A guardianship is a trust relation of the most sacred character in which one person, who is called a guardian, acts for another, called the ward, whom the law regards as incapable of managing his own affairs. Now think of it for a moment in this regard. You have a license to drive an automobile. Could it be that the state of Colorado regards you as incompetent to manage your own driving affairs? You have a marriage license. Could the state of Colorado regard you as being incompetent to handle your marital affairs? Now, the purpose of statutes relating to guardianship is to safeguard the rights and interests of minors and incompetent persons. Incompetent persons. And the court should be vigilant to see that the rights of such persons are properly protected. The court having jurisdiction of a guardianship matter is said to be the superior guardian while the guardian himself is deemed to be an officer of the court. Now when we take a look at the concept of the parent-child relationship, remember you got a marriage license, and the question arises as to what the purpose of the license is. Well, a license by definition is a permission to do something that is illegal, unlawful, a tort, or trespass. So when you got your marriage license, ladies and gentlemen, you wanted to create a tort or a trespass. You wanted to violate a law. You wanted to trespass on somebody's rights. And the state licensed you to do that, and you paid them a fee. And you created the guardian ward relationship in which the state is the superior guardian, and you become an officer of the court. Well, what happens to the children? To such a union. In several states, statutes authorize a person who, although of sound mind, when he believes that he's incapable of managing his own estate or of caring for his own property, he may apply for, or he may request, or simply consent to the appointment of a conservator or a guardian of his estate, or of his estate and his person, who, when appointed, possesses over the estate substantially the same powers and is subject in regard thereto to substantially the same duties as the guardian of an incompetent. Uh-oh. Could it be that when we signed up for that marriage license, we declared ourselves to be incompetent 
and then the state is going to come in and manage and regulate through statute the public contract, the terms and conditions then of the marriage union. Let's listen to a fellow who's had some practical experience along this line. His name is Everett Sullivan. You probably have heard of him. He's from Nebraska. He's a Baptist pastor who had a school and a church combination in which the school employed uncertified teachers. Now I can't imagine why anybody would want to operate a school with an uncertified teacher. I guess it means the difference between certification is competence and uncertification is incompetence. But I suppose if you were a teacher, the question arises, why do I need a piece of paper to tell somebody else that I'm competent? I'm either competent or I'm not. And so the state requires certification. And this Baptist minister thought that the First Amendment's free exercise clause was a bar to the state's interference in his church and parochial school. That wasn't true. And after spending some time in jail, Dr. Sullivan discovered that there was an invisible connecting link. Let me relate it to you in his words. Many people have asked me, how did they put you in jail? Let me say this, and it may shock you, but I have personally never been charged with anything. I've never been charged with breaking the law, and I've never been charged with committing a crime, and I've never had a trial, and I've spent four months in jail. Pretty unique for the United States of America. Now, Uganda, maybe, but America, Nebraska, the heartland of America, four months in jail without a trial. So you may ask me again, well, how in the world did they put you in jail? Well, I may not know much about you or your church, and I may hit you here, but I'm finding that this is one of the things that God wants me to tell churches. They sued the corporation. Now, I don't know if your church is incorporated or not, but if it is, then you'd better listen up. When a church incorporates, it becomes a creature of the state, and its officers become agents of the state, and the agents and the officers and the corporation have no constitutional rights. Remember in Hale v. Henkel, the Supreme Court told us that a corporation is created for the benefit of the public. It has no private rights. Now, individuals do. Dr. Sylvan thought that he was an individual who had private rights, but he had a corporation. The church was incorporated, as are most churches in America. The school was incorporated. And now, all of a sudden, Dr. Sylvan finds himself in opposition to the law of Nebraska. And by the way, he says, if you take a license for anything, you lose your constitutional right for the thing that you took the license out for. So every time you take a license for something, you waive your constitutional rights as they relate to the subject matter. So you have a marriage license. Well, then you don't have any constitutional rights as they relate to marriage or child rearing. Do you ever wonder why it is the state gets so upset when you put a bruise on jo Johnny's behind? They call that child abuse now. Or if you don't send Johnny to the public schools, they call that child neglect. But there was a time, wasn't there, in Colorado before schools? Was there marriage in Colorado? before Colorado became a state? What on earth did those poor people do when they wanted to get married before the incorporation of the state charter? Did everybody live in sin? Was everybody in reality unmarried? Which then produced a bumper crop of illegitimate offspring from which you descend? Is that the legal ramifications of this concept of no marriage license. Now I'm going to give you a shocker, and I don't like to do this because it makes me look so ridiculous, but you see we've learned some things. For six years we went down to the legislature and we said to the legislature, give us some relief. Now I'm glad tonight that I can stand here before you and say they didn't give us the relief that we were seeking, and I'm glad they didn't because the Constitution says that it's an area that they shouldn't be involved in in the first place. But as we testified before the committees, 
the parents would testify and they would weep and they would say, these are our little children. God gave us these children and we're responsible for them as they'd look back across the table at those senators. Senator Pfeiffer, who is a young, young gentleman, about 38 years old, who is an attorney and a legislator on the subcommittee for education. As the parents were testifying, Mr. Pfeiffer looked back across the table and he said to this one young mother who had just completed her testimony, do you have a state marriage license, madam? And she said, yes, I do. And he said, hasn't anybody ever told you that a marriage license is a privilege granted from the state and that every child born to a family with a state marriage license is a ward of the state? which now brings us to the guardian-ward relationship. When you got the marriage license, you created a guardian-ward relationship with the state, which is called in legal terminology a three-party limited general partnership between you, the girl, and the state. Now, if three of us bought an apartment house and one of the three of us died, would one of the surviving partners say, I want all of the proceeds. Now enters the concept of the inheritance tax, which just takes approximately 28 to 35 percent of the estate. You see, the boy and the girl work long and hard for 40 years until Roy dies. And during the 40 years, Martha and Roy have created a lot of stocks and bonds and motorcycles and snow machines and houses and condominiums and bank accounts. And as soon as old Roy dies, Martha, who has now become a total capitalist, selfish pig, says, I want it all. But fortunately, the beneficent state comes in and says, buy me out. And I want all cash. And so Mary has to sell everything at 10 cents on the dollar in order to pay the inheritance tax, or the children do, or the heirs. Well, Senator Peter Hoagland was on a television show with me debating the issue, and what he said to me on that show was repeated by the head of the state PTA and by the executive director of the State School Board Association. We were on Channel 6, live at 5, and the moderator looked over at me, and she said, Pastor Sullivan, only eight states in the union require certified teachers. Surely it must not be that important of an issue. And I said, you're right. And there's a way to solve that problem. And he said he thought national standardized testing was the answer. We had our students tested by the state's own experts, and we're a year ahead of the public schools, and two and a half years ahead of the Omaha public schools. We were so good that the judge wouldn't even let us put it in the record. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, I went to the public schools, and somehow I survived. I had a problem with recitation. Uh, my memorization was very poor. I would take the book home and I would read my ten pages and come back on Friday and try to regurgitate what I had read in the previous ten pages. And because my memorization and recitation was so poor, I did very poorly in the public schools and left at an early age. Perhaps that's why I survived and others succumbed. But nevertheless, she looked over at Senator Hoagland and said, well, Senator, why is Nebraska making such a big deal out of this? And well, listen up, folks, because what this senator said is important for all of us. Here's Senator Hoagland from Nebraska. He said, quote, the reason that we're making a big deal out of this is because fundamental Bible-believing Christians do not have a right to educate children in their doctrine. Because in the year 2000, America is going to be part of a one-world socialist order, and their children will not fit in. Now let's take a look at the Tennessee Law Review as it relates to the marriage license itself. I mean, everybody's got one, and obviously they must be good for us, or we wouldn't have spent the money to buy one. You know, you had to get up in the morning, you had to go down and buy this document, you had to fill out paperwork, in order to enslave yourselves, it requires money, time, and effort. you got to do something. Now, marriage has been defined by the Tennessee Supreme Court as follows. It, marriage, is something more than a contract. When you went down and signed up for that document, did the lady behind the counter say to you, 
<clears throat> this contract is more than an ordinary contract. Did anybody ever tell you that it was a contract? It is rather to be deemed an institute of society, that's when you become institutionalized, founded upon the consent and the contract of the parties, and in this view it has some peculiarities in its nature, character, operation, and the extent of obligation different from those that belong to ordinary contracts. So the Supreme Court of Tennessee then is telling us that a marriage contract is an extraordinary contract. It's unusual. Did anybody explain that to you? Unlike other contracts, it's indissoluble between the parties. Picture this. I'm going to sign a contract with you and it's indissoluble between the parties. It can never be terminated. When consummated according to law, it's of perpetual obligation and it cannot be renounced at the will of either or of both parties. It continues to exist until a dissolution is pronounced, either by the death of one of the parties or by a divorce. The rights and duties growing out of marriage are not left to the option or the agreement of the parties. You got that? Let me repeat that. The rights and duties growing out of marriage are not left to the option or the agreement of the parties entering into it. Now would you like to enter a contract with me? <clears throat> and when we sign the contract, it's of perpetual obligation. It's an extraordinary contract in which you can never terminate it, and as a result of it, you never have any input into the contract, and I'll determine what the terms and conditions are. How's that for a contract? Well, you all have one. How do you like it? The rights and duties growing out of it are not left to the option or agreement of the parties, but to some extent are matters of municipal regulation, that state control over which the will of the parties can have no control. None. When the legislature meets, they will alter, reform, and amend the terms and conditions of the contract called health, education, and welfare as they deem necessary. Even if you were married in 1950, the legislature can sit this year in 1990 and alter, reform, and amend the terms and conditions of the contract and are binding upon you in 1990, 1995 in the year 2000. It is an institution which lies at the foundation of social order social, socialist order and morality, socialist morality, and it constitutes the chief cornerstone of the whole structure of civilized society. Now let's see who owns the children that come out of this union. Now let's see where we're at. We have a guardian ward relationship in which the state is the superior guardian. You have an extraordinary contract with the state. And now we're going to have some babies. On Monday, May 19, 1986, this, quest this question was put to Mr. Jim Maddox, who is the Attorney General of the State of Texas. Quote, is it true that the State of Texas owns our children? Mr. Maddox responded, quote, yes, it's true. And not only your children, but you too. <laughs> How's that for candor? This is the current Attorney General. That's one of my students. He went through one of my classes and he said, I cannot believe that the state owns my children. So I said, well, gee, why don't you go ask your attorney general? He's the chief trustee for all of the children in the state of Texas, and he did, and he sent me back that affidavit. Now here's a letter from a lady who on August 6, 1985, had twin girls born down in California. Listen to this. As I understand it, this is a letter, by the way, from the Department of Public Health. This lady didn't get birth certificates for her children, and a question arises. Well, if you don't get birth certificates for your children, how is that going to impact those children in the next 10, 20, 30 years? What do you think would happen to somebody who was born and didn't have a birth certificate? Could you imagine such a preposterous circumstance? As I understand it, you gave birth to twin girls on July 30, 31, 1985 in that Mercy Medical Center in Reading, California. I also understand from the hospital staff that you did not desire to register the birth of your girls with them at this time. 
I'm writing to inform you of information that you may be unaware of. According to state regulations, if you don't register your daughter's birth within the first year of their delivery, they would then have to be registered on a delayed registration of birth form and the cost would be at this time $15. So the first problem that you run into is that if you don't get a birth certificate, it'll cost you 15 bucks later on. Well, I would presume that if you went to all of the trouble of delivering the child and then secreting the child out of the hospital and withstanding the incredible intimidation that the doctor and the hospital staff is going to heap upon you for trying to get this child out of here without a birth certificate, that 15 bucks probably wouldn't be that big a deal, would it? <laughs> Considering the fact that you delivered in a hospital and you had a physician in attendance, this would probably be of no consequence or trouble for you now. But in later years, this may be a problem for your daughters. So when they get to be 20 years old, there could be a problem because they don't have a birth certificate. Can you imagine what kind of problems could arise? I'm sure you're aware of the utmost importance of having a birth certificate as soon as possible. How many of you can think of five utmost reasons why you should have a birth certificate as soon as possible? Let the record show, one man raised his hand. He evidently can think of five. In 20 years, the hospital records could have been destroyed and your physician may not be available to help you or your girls. Now consider the fact that in order to be registered for school, you want to send your children to the public school, got to have a birth certificate. Apply for a marriage license. You want a limited general partnership with a state in control? To do that, you have to have a birth certificate. Grants or scholarships in school, the state of California requires a certified copy of a birth certificate. So if you want to go to the University of California, you want to go to college, you want to get grants or scholarships, you have to have a birth certificate. The federal government requires a certified copy of a birth certificate when applying for military service, a passport, or a social security card. So if you want to register for the draft, <clears throat> if you want to travel on a U.S. passport, many people think that's the only way you can travel, but there's five ways to travel four of them without a passport. I travel. I don't have a U.S. passport. Now, if you, if you want to go into the Army, how many of you want to go <coughs> make the world safe for Standard Oil, Exxon, and Texaco? You've got to have a birth certificate. When you realize all of the times that they may need their certificates of birth, you may want to contact me and we can arrange to have them taken care of. Please contact me if you have any questions. Now one of my students had a little boy, he's about six years old, up in Michigan. Michigan is one of the poorer states in the Union for what we call home schoolers. Alaska is the best, Connecticut's the worst. In Connecticut, if your child isn't in school, they want to put you in jail for life and a day. In Alaska, they will pay you to keep the little bread snapper at home and educate him there. <laughs> they have a little. And somewhere in between this <laughs> lies Michigan. <laughs> Dear Mr. and Mrs. Fry, <clears throat> this is to inform you that there has been a complaint filed with the Children's Protective Services stating that your son Robert is not attending school. How many of you people in this room care whether or not little Robert is attending school? I couldn't care less. If the little sucker grew up to be a total nitwit, it doesn't concern me. Because you have not enrolled him and you do not choose to have him attend. Now I contacted the Sturgis Public Schools and found that Robert was not enrolled and that you had been contacted about this matter. And I'm told that you reported that Robert is enrolled in another school, but that you refused to state what that school was. Well, it was. It was the Fry Home School. <laughs> Please be informed that Michigan law requires that children six years and older must receive an education in an accredited program. It's your right to select the program, but it must meet the requirements of the law. Who is this woman, anyway? 
Just picture this. Someone writes you this letter, and you've got this little, little child, and for whatever crazy reason has crossed your mind, you decided you didn't want to send him to the public school. Perhaps you didn't want him to learn how to split lines of coke or roll a reefer with his left hand, <laughs> or some other crazy antisocial purpose. But whatever it is, somebody writes you a letter now and says to you that it's against the law. Some of you people ever thought, well, this is my kid. I'll determine how I want to raise him. Now, who's this strange lady named Sherry Salmonson writing you a letter telling you that the law of Michigan requires? If you refuse to comply with the law, you may be subject to prosecution or to child, charges of child neglect. We're going to charge you with a crime. Now, I attempted recently to visit you at your home to discuss this matter, but I didn't find anyone there. Please contact me by phone or letter to let me know if the above information is incorrect and to verify your son's attendance in an approved program. If you have any questions about your legal responsibilities or your choices, I'll be happy to discuss them with you. Please contact the Children's Protective Services Unit at 467-6311 by Friday to verify Robert's attendance or to set up an appointment to discuss the matter. If we don't hear from you by that date, we will initiate legal action. Now some correspondence went back and forth in which Randy told this lady, my child doesn't have a birth certificate and I don't have a marriage license. <laughs> and on November 13th, Sherry sent this letter. It's one sentence. It says, upon a review of your case, the St. Joseph County Department of Social Services has determined that we will not be proceeding with our investigation. <laughs> now that's a very important concept because Here's a man and his wife who are antisocial. They don't have a marriage license. And their child doesn't have a birth certificate. And the state, who is very concerned about the education of children, sends a terse note back and says, well, we're not going to continue with our investigation. So there. Well, what causes that? Did it occur to you that perhaps there is a guardian ward relationship with the marriage license which involves your entire family? And that the state will not educate your children. They will only educate their children. And that's where the deception comes in. Because you see, you thought that these children were yours, didn't you? No, no, you made an error. You see, the state came in and they said, join this partnership with me. And you said, well, that's a pretty good idea. Because, you see, I'm going to give you welfare, aid to families with dependent children, free school lunches, public education. I'm going to give you 108 benefits if you'll just sign this contract right here. And besides that, ladies, how many of you want to live in sin? Where did that concept come from? Because, you know, my great-grandfather, old Abe Snyder, married a girl from Indiana back in the 1870s. And do you know he didn't have a marriage license? I'll bet you that old buzzard didn't even have a birth certificate. <laughs> he probably was a fiction of everybody's imagination because without a birth certificate, he must not have been alive. Does that mean that my grandmother then was illegitimate and therefore I'm the illegitimate son of an illegitimate marriage of an illegitimate family and we're a long train of illegitimates? Well, let me tell you that before California was, there was marriage and before Colorado was, there were childbirths. And after California ceases to exist, there will be marriage and there will be birth. How's that? It's a wild new concept, I know. But for many of us who have never heard that there is an opposite in law to every concept of law, there's a common law opposite. <clears throat> you know, instead of a marriage, you could have a civil marriage or a common law marriage, and there's a third alternative called a patriarchal family. There's three that you can choose from in marriage. 
When we talk about travel and passports, <clears throat> the government would have you believe that if you wanted to leave the country or come back in, you have to have a passport. But Title VIII clearly points out that there's five ways for you to travel. A passport is simply the government's solution to identification, but you could do it with an asservation, an affidavit, a family Bible, a passport. See, there is a fifth one. Slips in my mind right now, but there's a fifth, an asseveration, an affidavit, a passport, a family Bible, or a birth certificate. Birth certificate would be the fifth. Now let me show you a little something about this attorney-client relationship, because the guardian-ward relationship is the basis of your basic problems with the income tax, which is called voluntary. And I look out across this audience, and it looks like there's a whole audience full of volunteers out here. I think all you people have probably volunteered for this income tax and probably pay, pay that tax very cheerfully. How many of you like that tax? Let the record show that uh, there are no hands raised. Nobody in here <laughs> likes the income tax. Well, if it's, if it's so unpopular, then why do we have it? Or are all of you people in here just part of the lunatic fringe? And that in reality over here, the majority of Americans love the income tax, but for some reason you're antisocial, or you have not developed the social graces or character to love the tax like everyone else. Let me give you a little introduction to the attorney-client relationship, because attorney-client relationship, you ever heard of a power of attorney? It's a legal term, isn't it? Power of attorney. A client. You ever heard of a client and an attorney, attorney-client privilege, attorney-client relationship? Well, a client is one who applies to a lawyer or a counselor for advice and direction in a question of law or commits his cause to his management in prosecuting a claim or defending against a suit in a court of justice. A person who hires an attorney says, in effect, that I'm a legal incompetent and I'm unable to manage my legal affairs. When you need a doctor, you go to the doctor and you sign an admittance form, you go into the hospital, and you appoint the doctor as the guardian of your medical affairs. You went in, you got a license, and you said, well, I'm not competent, so I need a guardian to manage some aspect of my life. You go to a bank. You open a bank account because you're incompetent and unable to manage your financial affairs. What would the world be like if we became competent? What if you could handle all of your own financial affairs? What would you need a bank for? What if you could handle all of your own marital affairs? What would you need a marriage license or the state for? What if you could handle your legal affairs? What would you need an attorney for? Could you imagine the chaos and the, the unemployment that would occur if everybody in America became competent? We wouldn't need any banks, we wouldn't need any lawyers, and we wouldn't need any doctors. We wouldn't need any hospitals or any nurses. We wouldn't need any legal secretaries or judges. We wouldn't need any courts or judicial process. My God, that's unimaginable, isn't it? The bottom line is a client <coughs> See, one who communicates facts to an attorney expecting professional advice. Clients are also called wards of the court in regard to their relationship with their attorneys. I tested this one time, I tell on myself here. I was sitting in court, and this fellow was on the witness stand. He wasn't telling all the truth. Remember, he swore an oath, and he said, I'll tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. This guy was telling some inaccuracy, so I nudged my attorney, and I said, now you... You examine him on that point. And Bickle looked over at me and he patted me on the shoulder and he said, got everything under control. And so pretty soon he lied some more and so I pushed him again. No, write that down. You question him on that point. He's lying about that. Bickle, he pat me on the shoulder and he said, everything's under control. I've got everything scoped out. And so pretty soon the opposing attorney finished with the witness and he, ex and he excused him. And I became so distraught because my own attorney over here, now get this, I pay this guy $6,000 a year. Now when you hire some guy and he's working for you, and you tell him, you know, dig a ditch, and he goes over and goes to sleep, 
or you tell him, repair this fence, and then he goes over and milks the cow, or you tell him to clean the barn, and then he goes down and he mows hay, what would you do with an employee like that? So you'd get angry, wouldn't you, and you'd want to fire him? Wouldn't you want to say something to him? Wouldn't you want to kind of nudge him a little bit, tell him what he's doing wrong? Well, that's what I did, only I got so distraught, I jumped up, and I said, I object! Uh, and about that time, the judge just came unhinged. You ever, you ever watch this? And he, Mr. Gordon, you're out, of, you're out of order. I'll hold you in contempt. Your attorney will speak for you. Well, I hadn't been talked to like that since I was five years old and interrupted my daddy. <laughs> talking to one of his barroom buddies. And he said, little boys should be seen and not heard. And that's what that judge told me. He said, clients should be seen and not heard. Your attorney, who's going to manage all of your legal affairs. But my attorney wasn't doing a very good job of managing my legal affairs. I had the same problem with the banks. You know, those guys didn't manage my money the way I thought it ought to be managed. One day I woke up and I thought, well, and since I'm unhappy with the way <coughs> Johnston's taking care of my money here in the Bank of Idaho. I think I'll just draw all my money out of the bank and manage it myself. And I've been happy as a clam at high tide from that day to this. <clears throat> when I fired Bickle, it was a wild new step for me. And now I'm going to have to go in and defend myself. <clears throat> but I couldn't do any worse than this guy sitting next to me collecting 6,000 bucks. He doesn't even cross-examine a lying witness. I mean, the worst that could happen is that I'll just sit there like a bump on the log, and I don't have anybody to look over to, but I can say, I got everything under control. I got everything scoped out. <laughs> I don't have to question anybody or say anything. I'll just sit here and save $6,000. <laughs> His first duty is to the courts and the public. This is the attorney. Here's your attorney's first duty. His first duty is to the court. Remember, he's an officer of the court. And his second duty is to the public, and his third duty is to his client. So if you want to know where you come in when you hire an attorney, it's third. And whatever the duties, or and wherever the duties to his client conflict with those that he owes as an officer of the court in the administration of justice, the former must yield to the latter. All right, now, let me s uh, sum up by saying this. The problems that you have with government are caused by the contract that you've signed with government. And if you've got a sales tax permit, then you owe a sales tax collection and a sales tax payover to the sales tax commission. I don't have one of those, and as a result of that, I don't collect any sales tax and I don't pay any sales tax over. I don't have a social security account. It's a wild new concept. But then I don't owe any income tax because you can't be a taxpayer without a social security number or a federal tax ID number. And one day I woke up and I said, I don't like this income tax, so I think I'll drop out. Now you have to close your account when you drop out. Many people have forgot to do that and they get into trouble with their partner. And the government is a very powerful partner and they like all of their, their minor partners to pay off all of their debts. So I'd recommend you think about that before you drop out. I don't have a driver's license. I don't register my car. I don't buy insurance policies. I live a unique lifestyle because I'm what's known as an individual. Remember we read about the individual in the first document from the Supreme Court called Hale versus Hinkle. There is a fellow out there called an individual, but you probably are not one of those. Now, if you would like to become one of those, or if you think that perhaps it may have some advantages that are of some benefit to you, on Monday I'll conduct a workshop. And then on Tuesday, I have six schools that I'll explain in greater detail, and I'll talk to you about licenses and the income tax and private business, because I operate a school in Isabella, Missouri, and I don't have any handicapped parking there. I don't have a 25,000 book law library there. I offer no degrees, no diplomas, and I'm a high school dropout and I'm not a certified teacher. <laughs> Isn't that wild? 
Why anybody would want to come to such a school is beyond me, but I am booked solid. <laughs> I think it's because people want to learn something about law, as opposed to corporate capacity and licensing. There's an alternative that you could adopt. If you don't want a business license, you can conduct a common law, common law occupation or business privately in your own home all day long. The Constitution hasn't been amended since 1787, or it hasn't been significantly changed in its relation to private business. But something has happened in the last 90 years that's pretty dramatic. Most of us have dropped out of private business and gone into public business under some form of licensing contract with some state or federal agency. And as a result, you find yourself being regulated and controlled by that agency, whether it's OSHA or the EPA or the Teaching Board or the Professions Board or some agency of government is on you or potentially on you because of the contracts that you've signed. Now, in the back corner, it's my <coughs> left rear corner, if you are interested in our program, you can get a free calendar for our 1990 schedule, and then my wife will give you a blue card, and if you'll fill it out and tell me what areas of law that you're interested in, whether it's uh, private business and exchange, the income tax, or you want to drop out of the system, uh, you want to educate your children at home, you don't want birth certificates and marriage licenses, etc. If you'll check the appropriate box in the workshop on Monday, I'll talk about some of those topics that you're interested in. And then on Tuesday, I'll cover an entire day in which I'll explain what each one of these classes is all about and how you can drop your licenses and you can operate like your grandfather did or your great-grandfather about 1900 when he drove his wagon without a driver's license and he didn't have a license plate on the back of it. Or he didn't buy insurance or buckle his seat belt. You know I drive my car without a seat belt. I know it's crazy. I know you're supposed to buckle your seat belt and that it saves lives. And I would except there's a law that says you have to buckle your seat belt and as a member of the lunatic fringe, now I can't. <laughs> See what happened? You get a good law and then you get some antisocial deviant like me in the, pr in the program, and he won't buckle his seatbelt. It's crazy, I know. Well, my time is up. I thank you so much for your attention. Let's take a little break here, and we'll be right back. Don't go away, folks. There's more to come. <laughs>